On this video, I'd like to give you a brief introduction to the World Wide Web, or WWW as it is known. To do this demonstration, I'm going to be using a SunSpark Station 10. However, you can also use an IBM personal computer or a Macintosh running the appropriate software. One of the best programs to use is called Mosaic, which was first developed at the National Center for Supercomputers on the Urbana campus at the University of Illinois. Mosaic is freely available at no charge, although the catch is that the best method of getting it is via the Internet itself. The most important parts of the Sun computer, at least as far as Mosaic is concerned, are the graphic screen, the keyboard, a loudspeaker on which to play digital sounds, and the mouse, which I use to point at things. In fact, I use a trackball. My link to the Internet is via a modem that converts digital signals to audio tones that can be sent and received over an ordinary telephone line. For this videotape, I've edited out some of the time delays that occur when the modem is receiving data from far-flung places on the Internet. And this will give you the impression that my connection to the Internet is much faster than it really is. To start the Mosaic program running on my computer, I simply enter the command Mosaic. Once the Mosaic program has been loaded into my computer, it reaches out over the Internet and starts to transfer a document called the Mosaic Home Page from NCSA in Illinois. And you can see the RX light flickering on my modem as the received data arrives. Mosaic also animates an icon on the top right-hand corner of its window to show the data is arriving and displays a visual indication of the amount of data that has been received. After about 20 seconds, the NCSA Mosaic homepage is displayed on the screen. Mosaic's homepage is in hypertext format. That is, there are words, phrases, pictures, or icons in the document that are highlighted. And using the mouse, you can click on any highlighted item, and Mosaic will then retrieve and display or play that document image or sound. The next document retrieved can also be hypertext and have links to yet more documents and sounds and so on. It's important to note that there are no geographical restrictions. A single document on a computer in Portland, Oregon can contain numerous hypertext links to other documents and images and sounds stored on other computers on the Internet as far away as Florida, England, Russia, or Japan. Chaining from one document to another via a hypertext link can get somewhat tedious, so Mosaic has a hot list in which you can store the URL, that is the universal reference locators, that describe the location and hypertext documents of your favorite documents out on the World Wide Web. I'm going to use the hot list to go over to one of the intellectual property pages on the World Wide Web. It, this happens to be on a system in Austin, Texas, although I don't really need to know that other than to tell you for the purposes of this demonstration. I realize you can't see the entire page on the TV screen, but it consists entirely of hypertext links to other documents. In this case, let us imagine I'm interested in the international aspects of intellectual property law. So I'm going to click on the highlighted link to International. Then, after a few seconds, which I'm compressing for this particular videotape, the International page will appear. This also has many hypertext links, and I'm going to select the one for the Berne Convention. This document happens to be uh, stored on a computer system in the law school at Cornell. After another short pause, the text of the Berne Convention appears, and I can browse through that document. Mosaic also makes it easy to retrace back to a previous page. For example, let's go back to the original international page and branch out somewhere else. In this case, let's check out the Patent Cooperation Treaty, which also happens to be stored in the law school at Cornell. This leads us to a program running at Cornell called Gopher. That, as its name implies, is used to Gopher documents and retrieve their contents. I'm going to select the first entry, and up comes the text for that document on the screen. Assuming we've retrieved the information we needed, let's move on. 
This demonstration is really just to show you how quickly you can move around the web and the diversity of the information available. The Library of Congress has also got quite a significant contribution on the World Wide Web. Let's go over to their home page now and see what's available. And here's the home page of the Library of Congress. As you can see, it has several links to major subsections, such as the current exhibits, a photographic and sound collection, and online catalogs and databases. Although the temptation to explore these can get quite strong, and perhaps you can see now the addictive nature of the web, let's keep on moving. If you'll excuse me using the noun as a verb, let's hot list over to the West Coast and visit Portland, Oregon's answer to the Library of Congress. Let's try the Portland State University Library. In this case, the PSU computer actually tells us which user identification we should use to get into the system. And once we're in, let's see what books the PSU Library has by searching for the keyword copyright. And having entered that, up comes the display of books that is available. Now that we've seen some of the literary capabilities of the web, let us go around to the other side of the world and check out some of its artistic capabilities. Let's go visit Paris and see what's happening at the Louvre Museum. Okay, here's the Louvre's home page, appropriately named Le Web Louvre. It appears that we are the 157,000th visitor to this part of the World Wide Web. Now, let's see what there is to see here. Okay, there's a famous painting exhibition. I wonder what images might be available underneath this hypertext link. Well, it looks like most of this is text about various artists and uh, their backgrounds and the pieces on exhibition. Ah, oh, there's a hypertext link to Baroque artists. Let's try that. And here's a hypertext link to Rembrandt. Let's see where that leads us. And here's the Rembrandt page. It has a hypertext link on this small version of Rembrandt's The Militia Company. So let me select that. And here is the digital representation of Rembrandt's painting. Although this image is coming in from France, I think the original is in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. Now I can zoom in on this image to get a closer look, or I can even print my own copy if I have a suitable color printer. I wonder who owns the rights to that. Now the last time I visited the Web Louvre, I noticed something of special interest to US attorneys. It was on a page set up by Nicolas Pioche, the individual who maintains Le Web Louvre. Let's go and have a look at that. Oh, yes, here it is. You probably can see, US lawyer, question mark, this is for you. And here is Mr. Pioche's disclaimer. It consists, as far as I can tell, of every known disclaimer that he may have ever seen printed in English. You may not be able to read the fine print, but here is a sampling. The product is meant for educational purposes, subject to CAB approval, all models over 18 years of age, for off-road use only, sanitized for your protection, no solicitors, no alcohol dogs or horses, your mileage may vary. Let's move from earthly images to some of the cosmos. And to do that, we'll come back from Europe to the USA and check some of the recent Hubble Space Telescope images specifically those of the recent collision of the fragments of the Shoemaker-Levy comet with Jupiter. And here is a visual directory of the various images that are available, ranging from a short animation that, albeit in false colors, shows the cometary collisions, or an actual Hubble Space Telescope image showing Jupiter after several fragments of the comet have already collided with it. Images like these were available on the Internet within an hour of the actual collisions. In addition to views of other planets, the World Wide Web also offers some views of planet Earth. For example, here is an animated satellite view of current weather. These animation images require a large amount of data to be transmitted and take several minutes to arrive at your computer. Therefore, the National Weather Service also provides static images that only take a few seconds to transmit. 
This does not look like a good day for weather in Florida and the Gulf Coast. Finally, let's come back home to the USA and get a taste of the First Amendment coupled with good old Yankee copyright infringement. Let's pay a visit to Barney's page. By way of explanation, I should add that Barney, the purple dinosaur, is not particularly well liked by the people out on the internet for reasons that I don't really understand. In fact, the dislike has risen to the point where recently a jihad has been declared by netters against the saccharine Barney, albeit spelt B apostrophe H-A-R-N-E. And as I scroll down the page, you may be able to see an image icon called Barney on the Information Superhighway. Let's try that. And here in living color, if that's not an inappropriate phrase, we see the results of the purple dinosaur after, quote, meeting with a seven-ton Mack truck. We can even see the tire tracks. And if that were not gross enough, we notice on Barney's home page an audio clip entitled Barney Meets the Gestapo. Let's listen. The sound quality is not particularly good, by the way. The words you will hear halfway through are Guten Tag, German for good day. These examples may have been funny or perhaps offensive to you, but nevertheless they do encapsulate one individual's feelings about Barney and presumably are therefore protected under the First Amendment, even though it's highly likely that they contain a copyright infringement or two. And that concludes this brief global exploration around the World Wide Web. It really does not do justice to the vast amount of information that's available on the web, covering the entire range of human existence in just about every country of the world. And if that were not impressive enough, yet more and more information and new websites are being put online every day. It remains fascinating to contemplate where this will be within the next decade or so.